Good morning, church. Do you know how long I've been waiting to say that? It is so good to be back. I, I missed you, and have I told you lately that I love you? I haven't had the chance, but I do. I, I was able to worship with you online for the last three weeks, which was an awesome experience, and I want to say hello to everybody that's worshiping online with us today. Thank you for joining us online. There are lots of different places you could be online being today, but the fact that you're with us, we love you and we appreciate you. Uh, some of you probably already noticed that Nancy is not with me this morning. She did not leave me for the sabbatical, okay? I just want to make sure you know that. She went to visit our older son and his wife out in Idaho. She flew in last night. She's doing a little bit of quarantine to make sure that she's okay after being gone for a, uh, a few days. And uh, so she should be back next week. Now, in the meantime, for those of you who have missed me, well, I, I don't care whether you've missed me or not. I've missed you. Here's the thing. I am a hugger. And if you want to be hugged by me today, when you see me do this, okay? If you do not want to be hugged today, do this. Because it is my natural inclination just to hug you because that's who I am. And I miss you guys so much. I want to hug every one of you individually and tell you that I love you. But if you're not comfortable with that, just do this and I'll get it. You're not going to offend me, but don't hug me if you don't want to hug me because you're concerned about COVID, and don't hug me if you just don't like me, okay? And then I'll know, well, you're either scared of COVID or you don't like me while you're leaving the building, and I can pray for you. Um, there, there is just so much to tell you. I have had a tremendous last three weeks. I appreciate the elders and the staff. Somebody was asking me, what's the difference between a sabbatical and a vacation? And I'm like, well, with vacation, I'm really not disconnected from the church, but I really disconnected for the last three weeks. Uh, the staff did a great job of taking care of everything for me. We came back to some interesting things, such as the uh, passing of Leo Hours, and that, that was very difficult. And then um, Lester Leffler, as, as uh, was mentioned a few moments ago, passed away. Uh, I have been friends with his family for over 30 years. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was an elder in the church when Nancy and I were first moved to Tampa, and we were in our 20s. And so that was a very difficult passing. And uh, the family's kind of asked for us to hold our phone calls for right now because of the fact that they're still trying to figure things out, and they don't know what to tell you guys as far as a, a funeral service and things like that. Um, on the funeral home, evidently the funeral home's kind of backed up right now, so they're waiting on the funeral home to let them know when they can have the service and what's going on with them. But be sure and keep them in your prayers as they go through this difficult transition right now. And I got word this morning that um, Bennett Cozart's brother, Raymond, who is up in uh, Fayetteville, Georgia, and he is a longtime member of the church up there, he passed away, and they're going to be having funeral services up there for uh, him on the December the 19th, and we want to continue to, to remember the Cozart family uh, in our prayers. Um, I forgot to tell Chris this, but I was I went and had uh, lunch with Eddie Harper from the Southside Church of Christ this past Thursday, catching up with him, went to their building to see what kind of work we were going to be doing on the 12th. Um, and they are waiting on some financing and they're waiting on some approvals. So they've asked that we cancel that work day on the 12th and we're going to move it into January, which is better for me and better for you, I think, because this is a busy time with the holidays because I know you're, most of you are going to be spending Saturday the 12th shopping for Christmas gifts for me and my family. Um, <laughs> But you're going to be doing something if you're not doing that anyway. So we're going to reschedule that for some time in January. And, and, and I want to just tell you, I had a conversation with uh, Jesse Turner, and she, she and I were talking about 
well, you know, what's going to happen at this uh, workshop that's coming up for teachers? And I told Jesse, I said, Jesse, you know what would be a really cool goal for this church? That is, if every person in this church was a teacher. Every woman was a teacher, and, and later on I was talking to David Love, and he says, well, do you have the same goal, for, or do you have a goal for men? I'm like, yeah, every man should be a teacher. So if, if you've ever even had a glimpse of being a teacher, this would be a good time for you to show up. We're going to need uh, some help with this, and so this would be a good time to show up and find out what's going on. Um, if you notice in your bulletin, January the 10th is going to be a huge day for this church. Uh, you'll see in there that we're going to begin a sermon series on Romans chapter 12. Now, that's January the 10th. That's just going to be a huge day for this church because we're going to be talking about the relationships that we need to build and how to handle the relationships that God has put in our life through being Romans 12 Christians. And so it's going to be a, a phenomenal series. Now, what we were trying to do is fi try to figure out how we're going to do life groups. Well, I know some of you are, are meeting already. Some of you are having life groups from time to time. And we're not going to have formal life groups like we've had in the past. But we're going to have informal life groups. So if you're meeting and you're wanting to do a life group at your home, let us know and we'll advertise so that you can get some people to come. If you're not, wanting, you're not feeling comfortable with that, let's just say I don't feel comfortable because I'm at high risk because of COVID and, and things that are going on, we can do Zoom life groups. So if you want to do a, life, a Zoom life group, let Tim Jones know because he's going to be able to, to get it advertised so that people will know you're doing a life group. In this series of lessons that we're doing, we're going to have questions for you to answer and to discuss at the end of every sermon. So you'll have those questions so you can do life group as many as you want or as few as you want with Zoom, with the phone calls, whatever you want to do. But this is a way for you guys to get connected, to be in the Word, and to grow spiritually starting in January. So I'm real excited about that. And if you have questions about that, let me know. Uh, most of you were in here this morning uh, that heard the class. We started a great class on the names of God and kicked it off today. Really interesting stuff. One of the things that I was thinking about as we were doing that class is the fact that we get to have a relationship with God because he created us for relationship. And this is a great class where you'll get the chance not only to learn more about God, God's character and about who God is, but it'll give you an opportunity to grow spiritually. And then on Wednesday night, we're going to be starting again our series on John chapter uh, 16, the book of John, John through the, or Jesus through the eyes of John. And Tim and I will be doing that this Wednesday night. Um, it's kind of interesting that we've been studying the names of God, or the Ten Commandments. We, we've been studying the Ten Commandments, and here we are, the beginning of December, where the buying frenzy starts. Uh, COVID is here, but it has not stopped the porch pirates, Have, has it not? I was watching the news the other day, and, and they were talking about people who are following Amazon trucks and getting the deliveries just right after they're being delivered. They're just following the truck along, they're picking up. And I wondered, is it, is it like Christmas to them to open up the box and see what they got? Um, but, you know, that, that kind of theme just goes along with what we've been studying in the Ten Commandments, do not steal. But today we're going to talk about do not covet. And that is really an interesting topic for this time of the year. You need to remember that the Ten Commandments, as according to uh, Exodus chapter 31, the Ten Commandments were inscribed by the finger of God. I, I want you to think about that for just a moment. The Ten Commandments were inscribed by the finger of God of God. So what, when we're studying these Ten Commandments, we're talking about uh, you should not commit adultery, you should have no God, other gods before me. He's talking about all of these things. And at the very end, 
Number 10, he puts, thou shall not covet. Well, when I was thinking about that, I, first reaction was, well, I don't covet, so it's not a big deal. But maybe, as I thought about it more, maybe I do covet. M maybe, just maybe, I covet more than I think I do. I, I bought myself a new truck, and, and I was really excited about the truck. It has everything on it that I could ever even imagine or wanted and stuff I don't even know how to do yet. And I was real happy with my truck, and John Shackelford went and bought another truck. <laughs> and John, I think John coveted my truck. So he bought a truck, but when, when I saw John's truck, that is the prettiest red I have ever seen on a truck before. And all of a sudden, I began thinking, I should have gotten a red truck. Now, John's truck is still a GMC. It's not a Dodge like mine, but it's red. The reason why I'm saying this is because I want you to see that when you hear, thou shall not covet, it's a serious matter. It's not something, oh yeah, that's one of the ten, let's move on. And, and why did God put it at number ten? And I think this time of year is better than ever for us to hear, thou shalt not covet. And the reason being is we don't even realize we're doing it. We go around, and I, I, I was looking at some Christmas lights the other night. Now, I, I will tell you, I, I don't do Christmas lights. Uh, people think I'm the Grinch. You can hear more about that next week if you'll come back, because we're going to be doing a couple of sermons on Christmas. People think I'm the Grinch, but, but I, I remember thinking to myself when I looked at this one light display, I'm like, wow, that is amazing. And then I began to think, you know, I could do this and I could do that at my house and I could have that. And I don't even like Christmas lights. It's in our nature to covet. If you will look at the, the, the command in, in chapter 20 and verse 17 of Exodus, it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or his maidservant or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, most of you have been in the church long enough, you know who your neighbor is. It's not the person that's next door to you. It's not the person across the street from you necessarily. It's everybody that you come in contact with is your neighbor. So when you see that Lamborghini going down the road and you think, I would like to have that, that is your neighbor. When, when you see somebody pull up, in their Mercedes, you think that is your neighbor and you shouldn't covet what they have. When you see me pull up in my beautiful white truck, please do not covet because John Shackelford has a red one. My, my point being is that I think more of us covet than we realize. It, it may very well be that we covet the relationships that other people have. I, I, I know that I was talking to a friend of mine, and he and his daughter are kind of at odds right now, and they're struggling with their relationship. And I, I had told him previously about my relationship with my two sons and, and what was going on with them. And he said, man, I'd give anything to have that kind of relationship with my daughter. Could be you see a couple, they have a happy marriage, and you think, I wish I had that man or that woman in my life. If you got your lesson notes, look at the scripture that was read to you just a few moments ago. One of the things that I found so interesting about this passage is the beginning of the passage, because this is a guy's heart right here where he says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And, and, I, and this is just bottom line. He was coveting what his brother had. That's what it all amounts to. And, and if you look at this verse and you think about it in your mind, Jesus is up there teaching and expounding. He pauses for a moment, and this guy shouts out, Tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And you think, well, that, that's interesting, but how many times have we asked the government to divide other people's inheritance with us? It's not fair that this person gets that. It's not fair that that person gets this. And I don't have it. Covetousness is a disease of the heart. Now, let, let, me, let me just say right here, I happen to think, and I don't know for sure, but I happen to think that this man's brother was standing right next to him when he asked Jesus that. I, I, I don't know it for a fact. He may have just saying, you know, I'll go tell my brother that Jesus said, you got to go do this. Uh, it reminds me of the story of the two boys. There was one pancake la left, and they were fighting over who was going to get that last pancake. And the mother reminded them, boys, remember, you need to be like Jesus. And so the older brother looked at the younger brother and says, you get to be Jesus today and took the pancake. So many times we are coveting what other people have and we don't even realize it. Look, look at your lesson notes today. Why is the number 10 commandment so important? Number one, it can cause you to break the other nine. The idea of covetedness is that you're going to break the other nine because you're coveting what other people have. And like I said, it could be relationships. It could even be that you break the uh, command that, to not honor your father and mother because you covet things. As a matter of fact, in the time of Jesus, there were people who were putting money aside, what they claimed to be putting aside for the Lord and not even taking care of their own family. They weren't honoring their mother and father. So when we have this idea of covetedness, it can cause you to break the other nine commands. And I believe that's the reason why God put it last. And I believe that's the reason why it kind of sums up the other nine. The second thing is covetousness is a heart disease that leads to other sins. Covetousness is a heart disease that leads to other sin. In other words, when you start coveting something, that's going to lead you to other sins. It depends on how bad you covet something. I, I have seen people who have murdered because they coveted what somebody else has had. I have seen lives destroyed because they covet what other people have. I have seen families destroyed because they covet what's in the world. And they can't be content with what God has given them. Look, look at this passage in James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. When tempted, no one should say, God's tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one of us is tempted, now underline this, by his own evil desire and is dragged away and enticed. That's exactly what covetousness does. Then the desire uh, has conceived, after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Covetousness, no matter how small it is, can take over your heart. It's a heart disease. And in this day and age, with heart disease being what it is and what we know about it, heart disease left unchecked will lead to death physically. But more importantly, heart disease left unchecked will lead to death spiritually. I, I believe one of the reasons why we commune with God every first day of the week is because in that moment, we should be doing a heart check. We should be looking at what we're doing spiritually to make sure that we don't get off track and things lead to death. The, the third point there is materialism is a symptom of covetousness. Materialism is a symptom 
of covetousness. And, and I got I to gotta tell you, those of you, how many of you all in here are familiar with the band Queen? Just, okay, we got a lot of people that are old in here. Queen had this song, and it was my theme song growing up. I want it all, and I want it now. You remember that? And the, the idea behind that song was, was just that we need to have it all. We need to have it all right now. And I think as Americans, that's what we're doing a lot of times. We're working ourselves to the bone. We're doing more than we should be doing. We're stressing over life just so that we can have it all in our minds. And we can have it now. One of the things that I've seen on Facebook, and again, I will tell you that I do not have a Facebook page they told me I do not have the face for it. But let me say this. One of the things that I have seen on Facebook is people trying to show that they have it all and they have it now. Materialism is a symptom of covetousness. When you are materialistic, when you are looking to get more and more and have more and more without recognizing what it's doing to you, it is the beginning of coveting what other people have. Number four is we tend to rationalize our covetousness, our jealousy, and our desires. We tend to rationalize these things. We tend to think, well, it's okay because, you know, I, I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong. I, I just have this thought. It's not a big deal. It's not something that I need to be worried about. But I'm here to tell you that God said in one of his big ten, you shall not covet. And when you covet what other people have, when you covet the things of this world, you're breaking one of God's commands that he wrote in stone with his finger. So covetousness is a big sin. It is a big deal, and it's something that we should watch out for. Look at what James chapter 4 and verses 1 through 3 is. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God and when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you might spend what you get on your pleasures. When's the last time we looked at the, the blessings that God has given us as a way to benefit others? When's the last time that you've gotten a bonus and you've looked at it as a way to bless somebody else. When's the last time you took your paycheck and you put, put some of it aside so that you could just bless others? And don't tell me, well, I'm giving to the church and that's how I'm blessing others. That's your foremost responsibility to God. But if you want to get away from this idea of coveting, you need to get away from everything God giving you being for your pleasures and for what you want. You need to have the heart of Christ where, as was said in our communion service this morning by Chad, is that he, he disowned all the things of heaven so that he could come to earth and be with us. When's the last time you looked at your money as a way to help other people? Look at the rich man and the four mistakes he made in the story that was read a few moments ago. Number one, he forgot that he was a steward. He forgot that he was a steward. This is a very powerful story that Jesus is telling here because it shows the brevity of life and it shows how this man who had, had amassed a great deal of wealth and he was not thinking about how he could help other people. He was not thinking about what he could do with the money that God has given him. Instead, he was thinking, I'll just build bigger barns. I'll help. I won't do anything to help anybody else. I'll just make sure my life is okay. I will live for myself. 
Jesus started off by saying, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I've told you this before, but so many times we think, as soon as I reach this level of income, as soon as I have a home, as soon as I have a retirement, as soon as I have, then I will have arrived. Folks, your life is not made up of your possessions. Your life is not made up of your 401k. Your life is not about your vacations. Your life is about being a steward for God. And when you realize that you need to be a steward of what God has given you so that you can bless others, so that you can further his kingdom, then and only then will you be in the right relationship with God. Number two, he was not living for eternity. He was not living for eternity. I, I just want to say... When I went on my sabbatical, it was a hard time for me. A lot of people think, oh, you were on vacation, you had a great time. I did have a good time. I went scuba diving down at Puerto Rico. I got to see some friends up in Destin. I had a good time. But when I was really disconnected, when I was really by myself, and I didn't have the cares of the church or the cares of the staff or the cares of others on my heart, I had to be alone with myself. And I had to recognize some things spiritually that have been going on with me for some time that I am not living in light of eternity. That's a hard thing. Especially when you have to get up here every week and preach the gospel to look at yourself and say, I'm not living for eternity, I'm living for today. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because I want to see you in heaven. I want to sit next to Jack Beaverlin in heaven. And he can whisper to me the things that are going on. Because that's what Jack will do. I want to be able to hug David Love in heaven. And tell him, we made it. This is what you mean to me. I want to see every single person in this church in heaven, regardless of how close I am to you now, because one day I want to be close to you in heaven, because we're going to have all eternity to build that relationship. But the problem with this world is it sucks us into what is here and now and what is important here and now. And as Stephen Covey says, the urgent is seldom important and the important is seldom urgent. And we need to get an urgency about eternity. Lester Leffler, before he died, Two days before he died, I picked him up from the hospital and took him home. He and his wife were in the car with me. I got them to the house. We had conversation. Everything was going as planned. And he had doctor's appointments the following weeks to get some follow-up checkups. And Wednesday... They told me that it didn't look like he was going to make it. And Thursday, I had to sit in the parking lot with his family and pray as they disconnected him from life support. Like that, life was over. Like that, if God does not come back, COVID will be gone and we'll be back to what we normally do like that, one of these days, I'm going to be dead. And you're going to be dead. We need to focus on eternity. Number three, his priority was not on spiritual things. 
His mantra was, take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. He was more concerned about his own pleasures. He was more concerned about having the good life here on earth, or as the, they say it today, having the best life ever. More concerned about those things than the spiritual matters that God has placed on our heart, the spiritual things that we should be focused on. And in 2021, I want you to focus on two things. One is your relationship with God, and two, your relationship with others. Because that's what it boils down to. If we don't have the right relationship with God and we don't have the right relationship with others, we are doomed. And we need to continue to refocus ourselves on spiritual matters and where we're going. I, I don't know what the future holds, but I can tell you this, my heart for this church, my heart for the gospel, my heart for this lost world is that God will continue to keep me healthy until the day I die so that I can proclaim his word to a lost and dying world. And your focus should be the same. You may not be up here preaching, you may not be teaching a Bible class, but I'm going to tell you this, all the fun of this world is worthless if you're not spending eternity with God. All the things that the world says are important are worthless if you're not spending eternity with God. And you need to refocus your life on the spiritual things because the things such as your job, such as your vacation, such as your finances are all going to be gone one day as it says here, you fool this very night, your life will be demanded from you. You see, the problem with the rich man is he loved things more than he loved people. He loved things and used people. And I think sometimes we get that in our minds, that we love things more than we love people. It goes on, it says, then... Who will get what you have prepared for yourself? Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. So I wanted to end this lesson with some heart checks. And, and I'm, I know how this goes. I've been preaching for long enough. I know how this goes. Some of you have already tuned out. You're, you're listening, but you're not really listening because you're thinking this doesn't really apply to me. And you may be even sitting in here and saying, I can't wait until this is over because I'm hungry. You know how I know all that? Because I spent years sitting in there before I was up here. I, I, I know that some of you spiritually are just not, this is not even connected to you. You, you can hear me preach, and you can say, hey, Neil's got some passion today, but it's not even connected. So I've got four questions, questions that I think will help connect you if you're not. And, and this is really a tough one. It's, it's, are you happy or jealous when someone else is blessed? Are you happy or jealous when someone else is blessed? Think about that for just a moment. I, I know somebody that during the COVID and, and the things that were going on with it, they were making more money on government assistance than they were when they were working their regular job. Am, am I happy because they were blessed? Or am I jealous? I, I, I know people in my mind that, that they don't really deserve it and they get a windfall somebody dies and leaves them a lot of money and I'm thinking they're not going to be able to do anything with that what why did they leave it to them why did they leave it to me uh, are you happy or jealous when someone is blessed and, and here's another one are you stingy or generous when you are blessed uh, are you stingy or generous when you are blessed that's a tough question. And here's one way to answer it. Let's just say you win the lottery. What's the first thing you're going to do with your money? 
great vacation, right? Buy that dream home. Get that car I've always wanted. Or are you going to do something with it that's going to bless others? I, I remember one time, Nancy, sometimes she has a way of making me feel very unspiritual. We were talking one time about somebody that won the lottery, and I guess it was on the news or something. This was a few years back. We were talking about somebody winning the lottery, and I said, man, wouldn't that be cool if we won the lottery? And she's first thing she said, yes, we could pay off the church's debt. I'm like, no. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? So I was quiet for a little while, and I'm like, yeah, we could give them all of the salary that I have earned over the years, we could give it all back to them double. I got spiritual real quick. Because <laughs> I knew we weren't winning the lottery. But that's a heart check. Are you stingy or are you generous when you are blessed? Do you live in contentment or in need? In my budget, in my lifestyle, am I always in need? Or I'm in contentment with what God has given me. Am I always looking for a way to make more? Or am I content with what God has blessed me with? When I was younger, before I ever started preaching, I started a business. And when I started to business, I, Nancy wasn't working. She was staying at home, taking care of the kids. She had told me when we got married, when we had kids, I'm staying at home. I don't care what you do, but you got to provide for us. So I started a business similar to Chad. Wasn't sure what I was doing, but I was doing it anyway. Right, Chad? I started that business, and as I started the business, I got the money I needed to get the business started, but I forgot one simple rule is that you have to have income to provide for your rent and everything else. And so I thought, hmm, how am I going to pay the rent and get food on the table? I've got money to start the business, but I don't have money to do that. So I thought, well, I'll have to get a second job. Fortunately for me, the elders, I told them that I was going to have to resign as the deacon of education. And the elders thought about it, and they said, why don't you just come to work for us part-time? And that way you don't have to work on the weekends when we need you. It was the greatest blessing of my life. When I started with the church here at North Tampa, I, I know it's hard to believe, but there was only a small handful of people. They weren't making budget. They couldn't pay my salary. As a matter of fact, after they hired me, and, and none of the elders are here to defend themselves, but I'm telling you, this is the truth. After they hired me, Ronnie Jackson came to me and said, you know, you got about six months before we can't pay you anymore. You better start getting busy. Not in those words, but similar to that. And I came to work on half the salary I used to make and started a construction business. And there was a time when my construction business, I was making more money in it than I was working for the church. And I came this close to quitting the church to do construction full time. But luckily for me, I had a brother in the church that said, Neil, what is going to last through eternity? The money you make doing construction or the lives of others you can change. I want you to think about that in your life. Are you discontented enough that you're going to give up your spiritual, your relationship with God in order to make more and do more? Or are you going to hang on to the promises of God that he will take care of you and he will provide for you? I gave up a lot of money in my lifetime to work for this church. But God has blessed me more than I could ever even imagine if I'd worked 80 hours a week somewhere else. Because I remembered that I am not an owner, I am a manager. And I need to look at the things on an eternal basis. 
final question, and this is one I put in here for myself because I'm guilty of this. Do you one up people when they tell their stories? I am so guilty of that. I am so guilty of that. I, I did it this past week after I wrote this. I was talking to a, a waiter. He's a friend of mine. We were talking and so forth. And he was telling me that they had just gotten back from Clearwater Beach and they had spent time on the beach. And I whipped out my phone and I showed him pictures of where I was in Puerto Rico. Next time somebody's telling you their story, try to be quiet. If you're like me, that's real hard. But you can do it. Covetousness is a heart problem. And whether we realize it or not, everybody in here has heart disease. I love that Wednesday night class we just did, heart diseases and their cures. Because all of us in here are broken. All of us in here need a Savior. All of us in here cannot save ourselves. The only way for us to save, be saved, is through Jesus Christ. The gift of God's Son. If you're here today and you've never accepted that gift and been buried with Christ in baptism to walk that new life, we want you to make that decision today. If you're here today and you're struggling with something and you need the prayers of the church or to ask forgiveness for sin, Whatever that is, we sing this invitation song as a way to encourage you to make the decisions to be closer in your walk with God. The lesson is yours as we stand and sing.